Charlie, it's yours. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker today, uh, John Tyson. Um, John, please tell us about your living history. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sri and Charlie, for inviting me to uh, contribute my living history to this wonderful series. It's certainly a, a pleasure and an honor. Um, let's see why I'm... Click the mouse, John. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, I was born in 1947 in Horsham, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of Philadelphia. Uh, my ancestors were uh, farmers and builders and grocers and traveling salesmen, and science was never a, a big topic of discussion in our house. But in 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik, and our, nat our nation got into a tizzy about the space race. And I kind of benefited from the um, uh, from the emphasis on science education that uh, succeeded the Sputnik launch. In particular, I attended an NSF-sponsored summer school in chemistry and biology at Bucknell University, and that's where I became really interested in quantum chemistry. So when I started my undergraduate studies at Wheaton College in Illinois, I majored in chemistry and took lots of courses in physics and mathematics, I didn't take any biology courses because biology didn't interest me much at that time. Also at Wheaton, I met Linda Moore and we married shortly after uh, I graduated. And we moved to uh, the University of Chicago where I took up my graduate studies in chemical physics. I intended to be a quantum chemist, uh, but that wasn't going to happen because in my second year of uh, graduate school, I had a real, um, kind of down time when I thought, you know, what kind of an impact am I ever going to make in the field of quantum mechanics? Because after all, the greatest minds of the 20th century had founded the field of quantum mechanics. And I began to doubt, probably rightly so, that I could ever make any kind of an important impact in the field. It was at just this time that I met two young assistant professors in the mathematical biology program at Chicago, Art Winfrey and Stuart Kaufman. Art introduced me to the belarusov jabotinsky reaction, and Stu introduced me to uh, the mitotic division cycles in a slime mold physarum polycephalum. I worked with Stu to build a generic kind of biochemical oscillator model that we thought might possibly underlie the periodic events of the mitotic cycle in uh, physarum. And by the time I graduated with my PhD, I had left quantum mechanics far behind and was now completely uh, enamored with trying to understand the biochemical basis of many aspects of cell physiology, like cell division and uh, glycolytic oscillations and uh, pattern formation in developing embryos. They were, those were big topics at the time. After graduating, Linda and I packed up our two boys and moved to Innsbruck, uh, where I wanted to do experiments to try to demonstrate the role of a biochemical oscillator in controlling the mitotic cycle in Physarum. But my experiments soon convinced me that mitotic cycles in Physarum are not controlled by a continuous limit cycle oscillator, but rather by the accumulation of an unstable activator that titrates against nuclear sites in order to measure the protein to DNA ratio of the cell and trigger mitosis and a new round of DNA synthesis each time that ratio doubles. While I was at the University of Innsbruck, I met a young postdoc from um, Murdoch Michetson's lab at the University of Edinburgh. At the time, Paul Nurse was looking for um, genes that were involved in in, in the progression through the cell division cycle in a fission yeast, Geisosaccharomyces pombi. Of the dozens of cell division cycle genes that Paul isolated, he identified three genes as intimately connected in controlling the timing of mitosis as the cells grow. Those genes were called CDC2, WE1, and CDC25. CDC2, the genetic evidence was that CDC2 was the direct activator of mitosis. 
small cells, which are not ready to go into mitosis, in small cells, the we one gene product inhibits CDC2 and holds off mitosis. When the cells get big enough to uh, go through nuclear division and cell division, then the CDC25 gene product reverses the inhibition of we one and activates CDC2 and drives the cell into mitosis. That's what the genetic evidence suggested. And I was very intrigued by this and wondered whether the CDC25 gene product was perhaps the unstable activator uh, that was suggested by my experiments. Anyway, in 1978, we moved back to the USA where I started my uh, academic position in the biology department at uh, Virginia Tech. I, I started with a lab continuing experiments with Physarum but Physarum was not a good organism for doing genetics, and we were really falling way behind the yeast community. And eventually, I decided to shut down the wet lab and focus on uh, theory. During most of the 1980s, I spent my time focusing on oscillations and wave propagation in the BZ reaction, uh, collaborating with Jim Keener, a wonderful mathematical biologist at the University of Utah. But I never lost sight of the progress that the molecular geneticists were making in uh, unraveling the genetic control system of the cell division cycle. In 1990, Paul Nurse published this very famous review article on a universal control mechanism regulating the onset of M phase. In Paul's model, M phase is controlled by a kinase called CDC2 protein kinase. It's the product of the CDC2 gene that he had discovered years before. CDC2 is activated by, by joining together with an, with an activating subunit, cyclin B, to form mitosis or M phase promoting factor, MPF. But it's immediately inactivated by phosphorylation by the We1 protein kinase. When the cell gets large enough to go into mitosis, then the protein phosphatase encoded by CDC25 removes the inhibitory phosphate groups and activates MPF, which drives the cell into mitosis. To exit mitosis, the cyclin B subunit has to be degraded and the CDC2 subunit is released to be reused in the next cell cycle. This uh, pathway of activation of MPF is controlled by three feedback loops. Active MPF activates CDC25, its own activator, and inhibits WE1, its own inhibitor. And active MPF also activates the degradation system that destroys cyclin B and destroys MPF activity. And these uh, feedback loops are, are crucial to the regulation of the of the, uh, of the pathway. In 1991, I started collaborating with Bela Novak on a mathematical model of the um, universal control mechanism of, of Paul Nurse. We got a grant from the NSF that allowed Bela to come to his family to Blacksburg for 18 months. And during that time, we put together uh, this comprehensive model of M phase control in frog egg extracts and intact embryos. It was published in the Journal of Cell Science in 1993. The model easily accounted for the well-known experimental observation of a cyclin B threshold for MPF activation that drives cells into mitosis. But unexpectedly, the model predicted that there would be a different and lower threshold for MPF inactivation and exit from mitosis. And in between these two thresholds, the control system is a bistable system with a stable steady state of cells in interphase or in mitosis that coexist, and you're in one or the other depending upon the history of the, of the cell. In June of 1994, John Maddox picked up on this paper and published a short editorial in Nature called Cell Cycle Regulation by the Numbers. He said of our Journal of Cell Science paper, a mathematical model of the cell cycle of great interest in itself 
may be a first step towards the much more ambitious models people will be building in the decades ahead. And certainly over the next decades, we build detailed mathematical models of the cell cycle control systems in a number of eukaryotic organisms. The most elaborate model is the model of budding yeast, which was built in collaboration with Kathy Chen. I'm pleased to say that over the last 20 years, there have been a number of experimental confirmations of bistability as a unifying dynamical principle of cell cycle regulation. So uh, that's my living history. And uh, I wanna leave you with two pieces of advice. Uh, first of all, I think my experience in science may be um, says a little bit about the ups and downs and the twists and turns of finding a research project to devote your life to. And my advice is be flexible. Uh, not always going to be what you imagined when you were a young person. And what I found was it was important to find a project that was both interesting to me individually and also scientifically intriguing. But most of all, the thing I think that was important was that I found a project where I thought with my unique combination of experience and, and abilities and, and uh, uh, math especially mathematical knowledge, I was able to make a significant uh, advance to the science of the field. So that's how I would, I guess, advise young people uh, to look for a, a project that they can really devote their life to. And my second piece of advice is very simple. It's just uh, be home for dinner with your family. And I'll leave you with that and uh, be glad to answer questions. Uh, thank you, John, for a fantastic talk. And I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, so <laughs> thank you, John. The, uh, yeah, so the first question, I guess, kind of coming from one of the top the, the points from this last slide, you, you spoke about finding a research project to devote your life to. Now, at what point did you realize that this was the question that you were going to spend so much time unraveling? Um, yeah, well, I, I think you can see from the story I told that, I mean, quantum chemistry, although it was, it's, is very fascinating, was just never the right field for me. And I realized that early on. And it was serendipity or whatever that I met Stu Kaufman and Art Winfrey who introduced me to mathematical biology and theoretical biology, which was a really wide open field. But as I said, I had had no interest in biology. But all of a sudden, when I looked at biology from a new perspective, it all of a sudden became really fascinating to me. So that was the intriguing part. But I also felt like I had a unique combination of experiences and skills so I could make a, a significant contribution to a field that was wide open for development. Okay, then I kind of stumbled on cell cycle regulation through Stu Kaufman's interest in Pfizerum. And although Stu was completely wrong about how the mitotic system was controlled, it got me interested in working out <clears throat> the the real details of the control. But of course, that relied on all the wonderful work done by the molecular geneticists. And in the 1980s, while they were working out all the genes and proteins, I had nothing to do as a theoretician. That's why I turned my attention to my other great love, which was the of jabotinsky reaction. But then I came back to the cell cycle in 1990 when the time was ripe. So it's just, <laughs> you know, how do you predict these things? You got to go with the flow. You got to be flexible. You got to do what you think is interesting and important and uh, where you can make a significant contribution. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. And maybe one follow on question to that from the audience. Uh, how did you find the transition from experiments to theoretical research? Well, I was a theoretician to begin with. My PhD was in theoretical chemistry and I didn't do any experiments. Uh, then I was really interested in getting experimental experience, especially as I was turning to cell biology and biochemistry. That's why I went to Innsbruck 
and went to an experimental lab. And I really enjoyed doing experiments. They were fun and they were interesting. And I thought I learned a lot. Uh, but then when I got back to Virginia Tech and tried to set up a lab of my own, I was in a bind because I was working in the wrong organism, for one thing. Physarum wasn't right for doing genetics. And for the other thing, I was a mediocre experimentalist at best, and I had to admit that. And I was a very good theoretician. So before I got tenure, I told my department head that I was going to turn down the, I was going to shut down the lab and not try to do experiments. And I was going to concentrate on theory. And they ought to know that before they give me tenure. And uh, fortunately, for my sake, uh, they were okay with that. Great, great. Thank you. Um, and 